So I know we don't have a lot of people here today, but uh, we'll have to get started anyway, so hopefully we'll all trickle in at some point. Welcome. Thank you for coming to the main meeting. Uh, we have three speakers today. Sven Thiessen will be uh, speaking about his curbside residential. Uh, Vanessa Warhai will be speaking I've seen her. about uh, her, her new movie that she's producing. Worse than And uh, Chris Tung will be speaking about the arrives, I believe. Uh, Matt will be taking over. Curtis is not here uh, at, uh, after Vanessa goes. So let's move on. All right, so in the back, I had this last time, <laughs> I did something wrong. There's a little notebook uh, or your phone book sitting back there. And I'd like it if you at some point could come by and just sign in. And then put your car or cars in if you have multiples. And uh, that just is just a record. I want to know who all of our members are who's attending. Uh, I want to do it once. I'm not asking you to do it every single time. But uh, it would be great if we knew who was coming and what cars they were driving. Uh, the other thing is, at some point, I would really hope we get more members. We just literally lost uh, George B. Jack, who is the big vice president. Um, he's going on and doing something different. So I'll be loving to find out if someone else would like to take his place. Don't worry, it's kind of like being vice president of the United States. It's not what I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, All right, so past events. Well, we had San Jose State's event. We didn't get to that this year. Unfortunately, I got my application in a little bit late. And uh, they need to have a permit signed by the city. Two weeks in advance, I got mine in 10 days. So they said no. But Terry Hirschner went there for us. He took pictures, which is awesome. At the uh, Santa Clara event, this is the picture down there on the left. The right of it is uh, uh, the three cars that came. Uh, Sue, uh, I she was last name, and uh, Doug, Doug Brantlinger and I were there. Uh, the ZE Innovation Hackathon, which is the thing that was put on by the SF Babies. And that went off quite well, actually. I was there for maybe five hours. Uh, it was really fun. There was lots of stuff to do. Uh, and I got to be part of one of the winning teams, which, <laughs> considering the fact that doesn't really contribute it at all, seemed a little bit fair. Uh, but it was fun. And then the electric aircraft symposium, which uh, Jerry got to go to. So, I'm pretty sure. Oh, well. Uh, that was, I think, Ron. Ron oh well. <laughs> Jerry drove up to that and I lived just in Santa Rosa. Um, so they were gone and didn't get to attend our, our, uh, our the, the hackathon or our meeting. No, any of these events. And then for Toronto Valley, I didn't get to go to that because it's a hackathon. I'm grateful that we had it on the list. Uh, Los Altos Hills, I believe Jerry attended that. We got new pictures back. And did anybody get to go to the uh, open garage talk on uh, May 8th, Thursday, Wednesday? No, nobody? I know, I know Sybil told me she got to go. So hopefully at some point we'll get pictures of that. So upcoming events. Uh, electric car best drive. This is really exciting. Uh, but you'll need to register for it. Uh, it's going to be limited invite only. And we will be hosting the Santa Clara event there on the 31st. But uh, there's all these events. San Francisco, East Bay, Sacramento, Santa Rosa, and Monterey. Uh, you'll get a chance to drive uh, any one of those little, I don't know if you guys can see them on the bottom of the picture over there. But uh, they're going to have the, the Kia Soul, which if you got to attend, you'd have to be a Google employee. But there was an event yesterday, no, Thursday, uh, where they had uh, all these different vehicles. They had the Kia Soul, but it's just a prototype. So you can drive a plot at the end of, or when they start doing this, it's actually started this month. It's actually an owner. Somebody who bought the vehicle early will be driving it bringing the Kia Soul around while we'll get a chance to drive if you sign up for this event. I also want to mention refuel, which will happen July 20th. Obviously, we're going to have a meeting between now and then. But uh, I just want to remind everybody that refuel will be happening down at uh, the Mazda Raceway of Laguna Seca. Um, and you can, I believe, everyone can compete if you want to bring your car down there and, and race. I, I'd love to, but I, I can't even make it on my range. So, uh, all right. so. Uh, Doug and I actually had a meeting to uh, talk about this. Uh, it's actually the second point. But uh, the ev.wikia.com, I'm trying to encourage our members and, and uh, guests to have a look at this website. Doug was kind enough to add, add to it. He signed up and, and helped uh, populate information about Tesla. Right now, it's kind of devoid of information. But the nice thing is, it's a wiki. 
So just like the big Wikipedia that everybody probably goes to on a daily basis to check out whatever they don't know about World War II, um, this would help the public to uh, include this information so that we can all contribute to one source. I mean, yes, you can find this information on Wikipedia, but this is a collective source. It's just one place where all Wiki or all electric vehicle information it started when um, I joined in 2008, and most of the articles up there are written by me, but that's because I didn't have a presidential position to tell everybody about it. <laughs> so, but the forums are new. Uh, I mentioned that last month. The forums, uh, just another place to post. They are public, so you can post if anybody wants a private section. We can put that in there, but it's on on the website or uh, eaasv.org/forums. Um, you can sign up. I saw Sybil signed up this morning. Um, the reason I have member media on here is because I'm looking. If you guys go to events, I want the photos, please. Video, photos, everything. I want to post this on our website. I like the photo I had back um, here. Oops, this one. That's my photo. But please, if you guys are taking pictures with your camera phones or just regular digital cameras or any camera, I'd love to have that. Um, yeah, I keep pulling out the image. Um, for for our website to represent what we've done. If you guys went to the uh, had your oh, it was before, the, the Mission Eco Fair at Mission College, please send me those pictures. So that's the reason I put this up. Dropbox, etc. If you guys want a storage location, Dropbox is free, two gigs free storage, and more if you can find other people. Uh, I believe Google supports up to 15 gigs, and I'm pretty sure uh, Apple has a, a free storage space as well. Just send it that way you don't have to send me send me the pictures in the email. It's just easier just to drop it in something like that. And then uh, <laughs> for what we're doing right now, uh, YouTube live streaming. Anybody, in fact you probably could from your phone right now go to EASV.org slash video and see me on video right now live streaming. So I hope to continue doing this uh, in the future for all of our events so that we have well, for people who can't make it, like you probably noticed outside the uh, blockade keeping you from coming here. <laughs> if you can't make it for whatever other reason, I know Jerry and Tom couldn't make it today, uh, then you can watch us live on, uh, on our website through YouTube. And then that information will be uh, recorded and kept as an archive on YouTube through our site. All right, so check this out. Um, I talked last week about a window decal, but I'm having the same guy who made this image for us make the decal. But what do you guys think about that? That sounds like a. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. That's really busy. It's busy. Okay. I like that. I like the way you did it. You know, it's not spread out before. It was a little too busy and harder to figure out. Now it's very much larger and it's much easier. But you guys get the point. Yes. Cool. Yeah, we we yeah, we do, but I don't think Robin Joe and Jeanette is going to understand who they are. Well, no, yeah, that's a good point. But you, you, I mean, not everybody uses a credit card to pay for gas, but. Oh, oh, you're saying charge like charge on your credit card? Doesn't. I'm sorry. Yeah, that makes sense. Card. But the the dollar signs here. The dollar signs and the credit card he's got. I know it's small, but I guess we can improve on that. Totally it's, 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 it's not a dumb thing, then. Totally the gas pump this way. I know, I got, he's put his finger in the electric socket on the other way. I just need to work on the graphics as well, because it's the metaphor is fantastic. Okay. The graphics are well, yeah. we're not done yet. <laughs> yeah, the distinguishing things need to be bigger. You need to have the dollar signs flowing out of the credit card. Exactly. And a bigger lightning bolts on the charge unit. Well, this is a perfectly good example of how you can use the forum to tell me what <laughs> to tell me what's wrong with this picture. So, just to ask a foolish question: Is the assumption that the charge unit is free on the top one, or is there a charge for that? All right, no, you're right. It is. It, it's not money. It's a charging card versus charging on a credit card. Really, the idea here. Um, I don't know. Too. Then that's, that's a good point. It's still technically the word is being used, right? But it's a very good point. Um, so if the, if it was refill instead of charge? Well, the plan was so, yeah. charge. But, 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 but that's the question. How yeah, much message do you want? Because yeah. by picking words, you can change the message subtly. Yeah, yeah. Refill? Yeah. 
That's good thought. Put it on the forums. I really appreciate that, that idea. That's good. Okay, so <laughs> I'm sure you guys are all looking forward to this part. The so volunteering for uh, the National Drive Electric Week, otherwise known as EV Rally, it will be definitely at Dianza. I've spoken with uh, Dianza's uh, uh, representatives, and uh, we haven't paid yet, but that should be happening momentarily. I know we have funds. Yeah, September 20th. It's the end of Drive Electric Week. Um, but the poster, there's something in June, it's a poster. That's sorry to confuse. But that, that was just the poster from a couple of years ago. Um, nevertheless, I'm looking for volunteers to help out. Uh, we've got maybe two people who are really dedicated to this at the moment. And the more people I can get, you don't have to do a lot. I really just need to know if I can get your help. That's really what it comes down. Also, as I mentioned before, we will be looking for potential replacement for QT um, at that point. Okay, I'm, I'm listening. Yeah, I can use that. Turn it down. <laughs> you can hear myself. You can. Um, but I really want to get all this because I, in the moment, in, in to this month, I am emailing all our previous sponsors and vendors. Get them interested. Hey, look, we're going to be doing this in September. Please email me if you're interested. Um, and at some point, I'll need to help have people help me with either talking to them in person or going to uh, going to events and finding out what's what can be done. I, we have maybe 20, maybe 30 total uh, sponsors slash vendors. The more we get, the, the, the bigger the event will be. And, uh, just looking for help. So if you guys are willing to help, please email me. And um, we'll talk. I know that there are people who are interested in this. The more help I get, the better the better this thing will go. So I really, I really appreciate that you guys came. And you guys are dedicated, obviously, to your time. So uh, that's all we have for that. So let's get on to the speakers. Um, Sven Thiessen and uh, Vanessa Borke. I uh, Sven will be talking, as I mentioned in the beginning, in the beginning at, about uh, curbside recharging, residential curbside recharging. And then uh, Vanessa will be talking about her movie that's coming out soon, uh, Worse Than Poop, regarding uh, carbon dioxide, or monoxide, dioxide, <laughs> those oxides. So I'd like to uh, pop out here. It's given a full big image. Here is our youngest Ride and drive. <laughs> Come on, Sophia. Come on up here. Let's still stand for the camera so we can see it. So I'm going to pre present this. You guys can see. Certificate of, of, of uh, Appreciation. Certificate is awarded to Sophia Thiessen for her efforts in promoting electric vehicles. Thank you, Sophia. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Sven. It's your laptop set up here. So that picture of my daughter, um, one of the joys, at least with Sophie and I, is that she likes to drive the car around the block at very low speeds with me controlling the accelerator and the brake, and she's doing the majority of the steering, and she knows how to put the leaf in gear and park and the emergency brake and where you look for pee and all that stuff. And so at our congregation we had a, we do ride and drive there because our congregation installed a charger. And I told the, my, my laughter was, I, I told the board of directors when they voted to uh, spend the several thousand dollars, including the $459 permit application for the city of Palo Alto, that, um, we wouldn't have many people charging there, and as part of the, the Charleston network, it's the Unitarian Universalist Church of Palo Alto on 505 uh, Charleston, we, um, we've got people charging there every day now. We've used, put through over 3,000 kilowatt hours, and gosh darn it, as one of our principles being the interconnected web of light, um, I'm embarrassed, but we're raising money as part of it, because we ask for donations and things like that. So we do ride and drives. And um, this man wanted a ride in, in my leaf. And of course, um, I wanted him to drive it. But I was too busy barking to get more people. 
And so Sophie, Sophie, would you give a ride drive to him? We didn't know who he was, and my wife really gave me the stinky finger for <laughs> allowing Sophie to get in the car with some stranger. And what did you tell him how to do, Sophie? <laughs> Say no more. <laughs> So I have a ton of adapters. <laughs> this is probably the wire wire. This one, that, and that's the case. And there else is sound. That's my other question. We'll find out if it works. There's a, there's a plug for it. <laughs> so. I want to talk about two things. One is boring, and that's a new charger technology that I recently learned about, and I don't know if you guys know about it, and if you do, then you can throw rotten tomatoes or whatever, and then um, the curbside charger that was installed at our house. So to me, Ah, there we go. For you guys, I got can't lie. We got in trouble with my mother-in-law today. <laughs> We're doing too many things, and life goes on. <laughs> So it's called the company, and I have nothing to do with them. I just heard about them. It's called EverCharge. Yeah. You know, this is there we go. Lovely. I was going to say that was a quick flash in the pan, huh? Right. <laughs> and in essence, so you guys get it, I think. But I'm doing some work with con some volunteer work with condos and workplace charging. And if they, and this is the same thing that happened at our church. We had a dedicated 40 amp breaker that then in charge char provided 30 amps of power with a 6.6 .6 kilowatt charger. And if the car is there for eight hours, it actually could receive conceptually eight times 6.6, .6, 53 kilowatt hours of juice, of energy. All of about two gallons of gasoline, by the way. I think everybody needs to make sure we express to the public that when you, you know, how much energy is in that battery? Less than a gallon of gasoline, typically. I mean, the, the least 24 kilowatt hours, so the gallon of gasoline is about 30 kilowatt hours, energy to energy. So, I mean, that represents 210 miles, but the problem is, no, sorry, so nobody likes to get out and move their cars around, not likes. But at the beginning, it is because at the beginning, we're still the nascent stage where we're all together against the internal combustion engines. But I have been zapped by a freaking Tesla at the parking lot of the Alpha parking spaces across from the Symphony. It's, it's, I can't remember the name of the garage, but it's uh, eight EV charging spaces, four at 6.6 .6 and four at 110. And a freaking Tesla with a handicap sticker pulled right in to the par EV parking space and not iced me, zapped me out because it was the alpha parking space. But things, people charge a, a plug-in hybrid with a 2.2 kilowatt charger could charge here again, take somebody out who needs to charge versus who wants to charge. So the solution that this company's come up with is they do, I don't want to call it smart charging because that to me is more of a utility word, but semi-smart charging. And so they can break parts out the electricity, knowing that this volt only needs 2.2 kilowatts. So we're going to give it 2.2 kilowatts. We'll give the leaf 6.6 .6 or 4. And as cars come in and go out, they will allocate the amount of electricity so that that remember this is still the 40 amp breaker. It can supply those 200 miles. It will dump how much does that many miles of volt need? It only needs 40. If that Depending where it is, how many miles does the test lead? It may need 50. It may need less, but it doesn't lock out that 40 amp one car dedicated. And I think this is really important from a charging perspective. I, my charging conception 
on workplace charging is, is still evolving because I'm an engineer and when I get new data, by God, I change my mind unless it supports the old data. We're supposed to do that because we're scientists and engineers. And so originally I said everybody should have 6.6 .6 kilowatts every parking space or 80% of the parking space, but now, and then it went to every should have 110 charging, and now in a way it's this because you may have somebody that shows up for a meeting and only has two hours and drove 50 miles in a leaf, so they need the full 50 miles. So let's allocate that charging. So that's boring, but important. So I, if, as you guys go and as EV ambassadors, talk to people, let them know that there are smarter systems out there, particularly for condos where they are panel limited and workplace charging. Rolf at Google now, he said actually, if he had his choice, his druthers, he would have given everybody one tech. I don't quite believe that, but the idea being you don't have to mess around with changing charges. And when I say 110, it's not the outlet 110, it's a J1772 plug that will supply down to 110, or you know, two kilowatt power. So that's all the boring slide. Is that a, your website, Evercharge? Yeah, it's evercharge.net. Not .com, but .net, and they're, they're again, like I said, um, I like it. I like it. So basically, what you have is five J seventeen seventy twos connected to one panel, and it will it'll send electricity out to each of the vehicles as it needs it. Exactly. And no more than that disconnected. Exactly. That that is my understanding of the big picture. Okay. Um, I do not. I am not a spokesperson for them. I just said, hey, this tickles me pink, and and you guys should. Now you again, like I said, you probably already are aware of it. But I said, smart, and I, I and I also support Coulombs. They have one forty amp breaker and two heads, and they, they split it that way. I'm for that too. I think for airports especially, this would be great. When people park an empty car and want it a couple of days later. Exactly, and they want they need the car plugged in. Doesn't it drive you crazy? Yeah, it used up for a week. Yeah. Where does Evercharge fit in the, like, are they going to supply technology to the charge points in the EVCOs, or are they a competitor with other charging? So they, they're, they're, the, they're the middle people. So they have a box that sits between and communicates to other smaller boxes. As, so as I understand it, they're just in rollout mode. They'll have a, so let's say the chargers, this is the J1772 classic charger with the RF, I mean, um, all the safety crap in there. And then this is the wire feeding it. They'll have a little box right here, and here, and here, and here. And they'll have a main smart box that will monitor and talk to all the others to control the electricity. But if the 1772s are, say, charge points, they don't care. They're agnostic. They don't care. No, thank you, sir. I know I'm okay. Thank you, though. I guess I, I apologize. We're going to play tag. I promised her that we play tag before the meeting. And, and so I took my shoes off to be quiet and, and was thank you, Wes. Anyway, um, I'm going to move on. Just need to know, okay? Come on. Here we go. So this is the much more to me important talk. Because um, why do you do what you do? I can't help it. I follow I'm a chemical engineer. I do climate change work. I do energy. I do electric car stuff. And I am so worried. Although I wish I was a stock guy because sadly, if if I knew that CO2 was then followed by temperature, I'd be betting big dollars right now on the whatever temperature stuff, like air conditioning units, in the sea level, carbon dioxide is then followed by the, see the spike in temperature. So we're going up from 
270 pre-industrial. We're already hit months of 400 ppm. We are in big trouble. And I'm really worried. And why? Oh, Ms. Sophie, I'm sorry. I got it. Does anyone want to play tag outside? Has heard this thing. You're welcome to play tag with Elliot and Sophie. But you can walk, and you have to be quiet. Okay. <laughs> So this, this sort of data, as an engineer, just really gets me fired up. Because it's, it's like the politicians and the scientists, sorry, the politicians are not listening, and the general public is not listening. Where we have the standard deviation was here, and now it's moved over to the left, into this way hotter, hotter, hotter craziness. And what directly impacts me is that as a driver, there was an evil professor in Phoenix, Arizona. This is and he wanted to correlate temperature to kindness and anger. And so what he did, he had one of his assistants stop at a red light at the front car and then timed how long it took for the guy or gal behind him to lean on the horn to go. <laughs> when do people have more patience? When it's cooler outside. So the whole term hothead and all that is so true. So those temperature curves I showed you is going to lead to a whole bunch more angry, crazy drivers. But the joy about ED, once you do get that hump from behind you, you're gone. <laughs> and it, 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 that to me is just one microcosm. But seriously, we are so, I'm, I'm ex pg &E, where it was, I live in Palo Alto. Where do we get our carbon, stand up straight everybody, where do we get our carbon free electricity from? Hydro. Hydro. Where does hydro come from? Snowpack. We used to be in big trouble. There's hardly any snow up there. And it's just going to get worse. And we're going to have to build bigger reservoirs to catch what snow melt there is because the snow melt from being la 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 three months to six months long is going to be a month, two weeks. Because once that rain starts hitting that snowpack, it's gone. And we're in the drought. That's great. Did you guys read about what happened in Florida? They had two feet, 24 inches of rain in less than 48 hours. And they don't know exactly how much rain they had because the rain gauge was destroyed in the storm. I mean, so what? who's doing stuff? And what do I do? What do we do? So. The bathroom. This is important, people. <laughs> Climate change, as you get hotter, your bladder, while well, stays the same, water expands with temperature. <laughs> so you've got to quicker, more quickly go to the bathroom beforehand. That nice lady is going to show you something. Does anybody need to? It's at the far end on the right hand side. Okay? But seriously, think about it. Water expands, you get warm. But I'm thinking, what am I doing? What am I called to do? What are our leaders doing? So this is beautiful. This is great. But these people, these students, are doing way better. This is roughly a month ago. 400 kids, I'm 50 years old, I can say kids, got arrested. And these, like, okay, these are awesome people out in front of the White House, but that's halfway across the country. What can I do? Well, maybe I could be like this guy. Do you guys know who this is? This is Dr. Jim Hansen ex-head of the Goddard Space Center. And what I'm collecting is pictures of him being arrested. And I've only got two so far, but I read, someone told me I read something. He's been arrested 20 times because in his world, we are, why are we, the house is on fire, people. Do something. And I got Sophie and a Genevieve and a wife, and they kill me if I, I can't get arrested. So what about this guy? I just learned about him about three weeks ago. He's a biologist, and he lives in this national forest, or essentially in, not in, but near it. And what is he doing? And this is sort of 
gut in my world. You know, in the Harry Potter books, there's the George and Fred, the, good, the practical jokers that are on the on this side, just this side of naughty, and but they're 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 giving joy to the movement by doing something sort of illegal. Well, you know what this guy's doing? What Johnny's doing? This is a national forest. There are illegal palm oil plantations in the forest, and you know what he's doing? Cutting them down. Just with joy and righteousness and powerful chainsaws and that that is hey that sounds like fun because that is like it's not the sort of righteousness it is the chainsaw of righteousness so I, I want to do something that's the sort of fun I want to have so what I did in the middle of the night one weekend some bunch of gnomes came along in the front of my house and. Bore a, a tunnel under the sidewalk, and God bless them, they installed an electric car charger right in public property in front of my house, and they wired it up, and you know what? We're giving away electricity there. Take that, all you ice drivers. Anybody care to give away gasoline? <laughs> you seen that anywhere? Yes, ma'am. For, for, what, how, how much does it cost, Sophie? How much? What did you just tell me? Zero. Zero. Free. And you'll be a portable so we have portable takes on our house. It costs eight cents a kilowatt hour. Who cares? Here's the joy. You know what these people do when they charge at my house? They give me thirty or eighty dollar bottles of wine. <laughs> you know, let's have some joy. I was actually hoping they'd be known on there. Dear Sven and family. Thank you for your efforts. This car is yours. <laughs> so, I haven't got there yet. These were test So the, the joy is, and this is somewhat important, Palo Alto was, was doing this show in September of last year. And they had city council, the city had nothing to announce about EVs. And I met with John Foster, who's the head of our volunteer utility commission. And he said, so then I've been thinking about this, and I, there's something wrong, and I don't like it. And I said, I'm really fired up. And he goes, then do something. And I called up all the city council members. I'm, I'm blessed. I'm a consultant. I work from home. I do the laundry. I wash the clothes of my kids. I'm on my hands and knees going through clothes. Is this clean, or does it need some spray and wash? Okay, it's clean. With my list of all the council members' phone numbers, and said, I'm fired up. We need to announce something. Why not just simply announce that any new, any new house that's built in Palo Alto will be pre-wired for EVs? And we got a couple of city council members to say, that's a great idea. And we changed it. Thank you. Where's Mark Geller? He's not here. God bless him. He said, why not all parking new parking lots? And we changed it to all new parking lots. And then city council members got involved and wrote a terrible memo to colleagues. But they said, because we included that we we're going to allow residential curbside charging, but they were going to keep it as a pilot of one. <laughs> and I was like, no, you can't do that. And I'm thinking, what can I do to save this? And I happen to be blessed that Palo Alto is Palo Alto and tracks sort of people that they do, and that some young lady at the back agreed to make a movie about the curbside charger. And I want to show it to you. God, I hate this part. I'm sorry, everybody. I should be so much better. But I got in trouble with my mother-in-law this morning, and I am. that's why I was not on time. And I'm hoping... Where's the sound? Maybe you never get the phone. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jeff Better. I live at three 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 Wheeland in Palo Alto, right around the corner from this uh, electric charger. 
this is my public testimony for the Palo Alto City Council meeting, item 8 on the agenda. Renee, will you please call us in? Last year we drove a leaf at one of our uh, neighbors, some other people open houses. And uh, we liked it so much we went and bought one. But now in the meantime, while we're still working out a charger logistics at our house, we've been using this curbside charger as our primary means of charging our leaf. I believe this is the nation's only permitted curbside EV charger, and I'm glad to use it. My name is Christina Benner. Jeff and I liked the leaf so much that we decided to sell our other car, which got about 20 miles to the gallon, and replaced it with a Tesla. We usually charge the Tesla at work, but occasionally we charge it here too. The fact that we have an EV charger accessible to us has played a key role in our ability to drive electric vehicles. So far, we have driven 3,000 carbon free miles, which translates into 3,000 pounds of carbon dioxide saved. Imagine if everyone in the city of Palo Alto could do this. Well, we are pleased with the direction of Council's colleagues in that we strongly encourage the city of Palo Alto to establish a simple, affordable permitting procedure for residential curbside charges. We love this curbside EV charger. So, could I please have a set of applause from Ms. Vanessa at the back? We have, we have the filmmaker here. And you know those Burge and Gerge from that Harry Potter book? That's the laughter I was able to bring into the boring, stay, dark city council meeting when I showed that. And they suddenly got it, even though one of the mayor at the time has a Tesla. Nobody else had shown them, oh my god, there's a little kid charging the car. I mean, we all we need to do was have a dog in the in the film and apple <laughs> pie, you know, and, and show my photovoltaics. But the key thing was it showed that the car was it, it, you guys get it, because you're here, because you get it. This may change. If you're in fighting with a city about stuff, show them this. So going back to what the boring stuff now, what do we do at my house? No one has given me this car yet. <laughs> but what do we do? So those rascally gnomes Plug, installed it, and we got permission at our, our we, we built an Uber, an energy efficient home. We got permission to do that one time charging for that one time event after those rascally gnomes had installed it. And then I said, finally, and, and then and they said, but you have to take it out. You have to dig up the wires and take it out. Damn those gnomes. <laughs> and luckily, someone called me and said, hey, could you have an event at your house in three weeks? I said, okay, I think I need to have an EV charging station there too. And they said, oh yeah. So I called the city back and they said, and said we've been a, a requested to have another smaller open house and they want to show the EV chargers. Can we keep it in? <laughs> and they let us. So we, we jumped from event to event and finally said, I got to get it plugged in. I called the city. I thought I'd, I'd done wrong. <laughs> And the joy was the person I spoke to, Sven, I support you. And I knew we won. And so, I, I, although I didn't know how intensive and boring it would be, but in essence, the joy is, and this is what I want you to communicate to the cities you live in when you have a friend that needs to do this because they don't have parking and charging on their driveway or whatever. Just fill out the basic EV charger form that your permitting yahoos make you do when you do electrical work. Not a big deal. And then your city likely has, will have, this is called a public utilities easement slash encroachment form. All it means is the area of your sidewalk and in front of your sidewalk belongs to the city for your utility crap. Well, you want to put in some utility crap. You want to run some wires. Who's paying for the electricity? You are. Who's paying to install it? You are. You may give it away. You may choose to lock it out for your own personal business. Um, you know, that's for your own charger. That's fine. You may even choose to charge to sell it. That would be breaking ice. As I said, I will only give it away. The only thing you need to be careful of is when you say, 
I, I'm not limiting anyone to park here because it is public street in front of our house. Anyone can park there. I can't put up a sign like I have on my driveway that says EV cars only, others will be towed. Can't do that on my driveway like I have on my driveway because it's public. But you can do anything else. You can put up signs to say anyone who's not charging here will be cursed. You know, whatever you want to say. <laughs> so, so really simplify it to whoever you're working with to say it's just, guys, relax. Palo Alto, Derek, you know, pain in the you-know-wheres, they've done it, no big deal. Don't let them call the city and speak to certain individuals because they will say not gnomes installed at the beginning. They say Sven did it illegally. And to me, and this is what Felix Kramer, another one of my heroes, he said, Sven, that's the way, the way startups do it. Damn the law, full steam ahead. I feel like I'm, I'm one of those Tea Party people, you know? I object to the British high taxes. Throw that tea overboard. Fred and George, Harry Potter. Then the other thing you need, this is what they require, is, and the joy was, if you are a homeowner, you probably already have it. You need, they will ask for a million dollar liability. And you have that in your own homeowner's insurance if you have a million dollars. You may have to go up to a million dollars, but we already had it because we're freaking in Palo Alto. Although, <laughs> if anyone wants to burn my house down, I've learned a lot. I want to start over again. Don't tell my wife. <laughs> so, but you take, you go, we went to State Farm and, and we didn't even have to argue with them. We just had to say, those crazy people in Palo Alto need our homeowner's insurance on this form called Accord, which is this, it's a commercial insurance. And they said, okay. And of course, I listed my wife first because she's the love of my life. So do nice things like that. And they ask you to indemnify all the people in your city. The point being, when you go to your city to do it, you just say, it's been done before. It's not that hard. Relax. You're going to get an award and accolades and get to talk about be heroes. Chill. So it's legal. And we got a pilot. And if anybody else wants to do it, use this as an example. Bring him by, show him the movie. And I just want to introduce you to my latest best friend. This is Michelle Gorey. She works in Palo Alto and lives in frickin' Antioch, poor woman. Mm. Two to four days a week, she drives from Antioch in her fault. And there's no charging at work. There's no charging near where she is. So she comes to my house and plugs in. Oh my God, it's awesome. And she puts a, she parks near the curb, my driveway, so that a car can park behind her, because we don't, we're living in a residential, and has a sign saying, okay to unplug as needed, and unplug for sure after whatever time is after her uh, two, it's a, what's, a, what's the vault charger? It's a three, three kilowatt charger, anyway. Roughly after three hours, she puts a sign up on her windshield. So it's, again, take the power if you need it. At, take me out if you need it. And if you don't, I'll be done at whatever hour. God bless her. And the joy is, as part of this, we're going to keep the public only the pilot program for the curbside charge for one. She wrote this schmoozy boozy letter to Jim Keen to say, you guys are heroes. And we're the pilot program. Anybody in Palo Alto who wants to do this, they permit it on a case-by-case -case basis. We just use those forms. Um, and so far, no one else, the mayor, ex-mayor city, is going to, but nobody else has taken this up on it. So this all started with climate change. So I want to go back to, I grew up in North Carolina. I may not sound like it, but I did. And some of that is instilled in me, and there's like this honor duty, responsibility. It's weird. I feel like I'm a little kid when I've installed the charging system. I broke the law. I torqued up a bunch of people, but I gave a lot of joy. But I have honor and duty and responsibility to my kids and my, my parents and their legacy that they gave me. And the critters on this are all the joys that I've been able to experience and the silliness of Sophie and Elliot back there. So my sort of, what am I doing? What do I, what is my honor and my duty? Well, the joy is to divest. Because then I'm not paying them to fight me. No, nope, not part of that anymore. And I bought oil stocks thinking Chevron was a reasonable oil company back in 1996. 
and they're all evil, and I was part of the evil. Not evil, they're all good people that work there. I'm a chemical engineer, God bless them, but they're, can we change? So just do that, just do it. And the joy is, you do it, you feel good. And this talk about shareholders actually changing things, I don't think that engagement really works. Just do it, just get out of their system. And then, how many people here have photovoltaics on their roof? So what we have here is you want to be the joy and show everybody, this is the Eyes on Solar campaign. Where's my solar people? Okay, these, so can you pass these around for me, okay? I want you, no, okay, fine, here we go. Eyes on Solar campaign. And I'm going to put this up on our house website. And I don't know who I'm going to work, both Solar or Mike Palma. But we're going to have a competition to have you take your neighbor, just talking there, and they look, oh, it's interesting, you have photovoltaics on. I say, yes. Oh, <laughs> we got photovoltaics on. This is the joy that they give us in terms of how much energy we give or our utility bill. It was a pain in the ass or not. Get the word out. And how many people have EVs here? All right, Elliot and Sophie, could you please pass this out for everybody who has EVs? Everyone has EVs. Everybody who has an EV, so give them one of these sheets. This is called the Bones and Seats. My mother is English, that's why I don't talk I do coming from North Carolina. Please pass these out. We use English as English can be. We don't use the word B U T T S in our house. We use the word bones. So this, Mark Geller and I are in competition to get more people than he does or I do to drive our cars. And so whenever we do, remember Sophie? Yeah. That's what Sophie got a point for having somebody drive my car compared to Mark Geller. And now you guys are part of it. And for everybody that owns, everybody that is both an EV driver and PV, please hold your hand up. Okay, Sophie and Elliot, would you please give them one of these? Okay. Would you please give them one of these? Okay, there we go. Give them only only the people who have both. Okay. Because I'm going to jump to way down here. Anybody here in Palo Alto, not here because there's a, here, look here. There's a free energy audit that you can get from Actera. You know how much it costs? It's free. And they, even in our... 2011, beyond platinum lead, net zero energy, German passive house, they figured out why our ice cream was like a brick in the freezer, because even though the monitor on the freezer said 30, 30 degrees Fahrenheit, it was actually 20, and so the ice cream was frozen solid, and that also explained why they also said, hey, dude, your, free, your fridge is rated at 1.2 kilowatt per day, and it looks like it's using a lot more energy than that. It's like, yay, they found a problem. They solved it. And they said our Uber 1.5 gallon per minute showers were really 1.5 gallon per minute showers. So get that done. Stand up to fund the police because they eventually will change their mind. And then that's what I'm passing out right now. Advocate, demonstrate, support clean technologies. And when I say that, our household no longer, no longer gives away bottles of wine when we go to business somewhere. We give away LEDs. You know, and we not only do we give them away, but depending on how we like them, we give them away. They're more or less, but we screw them in. And we put them in places that are high up and say, you're going to be dead before that bulb needs to be changed. And so as part of this, I want you guys to think about joining me in this. These are $6.00 a piece when you buy them in cases of 10 or more. And normally they're selling them through FIRST, which is the robotics program. You guys, the high school robotics program, you may have heard of this guy, Dean Cannon. The Segway guy, it's electric. He's one of us. He started this high school program of doing robotics to get kids inspired in science and technology. And a friend of mine, works with them, they got a big grant from Google. So if anyone else wants to join in, I've given two presentations when this idea hit me. Who's in for a case, oh, gentle, who's in for a case or a half a case with me? Please talk to me afterwards. You don't have much time. It's so much more fun. 
so much more fun than giving away wine. Okay? Okay? Exactly. We are. So, as part of this, that technology, the next thing is, I talked about, get that politician of yours on board. I want you to be part of this and support the arts and support people who are doing equally fun, entertaining, educational, great things. And Ms. Vanessa is going to talk about that. And the joy is, you've already seen some of her work. And the joy is that work that she did is already working. You know why? Because you can come to my house and charge for free and feel it yourself. I'm doing it because, because of these guys. And i got to go to my nine-year-old's birthday party right now, Sophie. Yeah. And I, because so they can have kids and not have a crappy life. It won't be crappy. It's just the, the level of species diversity, the level of humankind interaction, that whole, it's getting hotter, we're hot, going to have more hot heads. That whole, I don't want them to be subject to that just because my government didn't have the smarts to address this way back when they could have. So I'm calling you to act on your honor, your duty, and do something. Thank you. All right, Sophie, we've got to go. Yeah, we, we got. We do have to go to a birthday party. My sisters. Even though our birthday, real birthday, was actually in January. Uh, no. Very, very. She Thank you, Sven. So again, but before I go, I, I think you guys are a little bit of a bunch of pansies. Who's here for hundred and twenty dollars worth of wine? Well, who's ever bought hundred and twenty dollars worth of wine? I'm going to buy some LEDs. We don't need this. Where did Sophie put my shoes? And they're in the bag. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Come to my house, 314 Stanford, charge them up. Hi everyone. That's what I thought. All right. Give me a sorry, I also was late. I did not text my mother in law this morning. <laughs> Luckily. She's in Georgia. Um let me just get this. Just a second, sorry. To work amongst yourselves. So, um, hi everyone, I'm Vanessa Forhey, and this is my son Elliot, stand up here so they can actually see you. Oh, I see, there we are. Stand like this so that they can see me online. Um, and we are um, friends of Sven's, neighbors of Sven's, and um, as Sven said, I made that film that you just saw, that's the longer version. If you want to share it with your city councils or friends or neighbors, um, there's actually a shorter version that doesn't have the council's memo and is a little bit tighter. and um, 
a little less awkward. I made that in a weekend. Um, it's sort of funny that you know some films you work on for years and they nobody ever sees them, and then you work on something for a weekend because Sven says, "Hey, what are those things with my ears?" And you go, "Yeah, I'm trying testing out a camera." And the next thing you know, like you made a movie that is being shot everywhere. Um, that's what happened with that one. So this film um, that I want to talk to you about is called Worse Than Who. Um, it stars Elliot um, as Professor Elliot, the climate scientist. Um, and I'll just give you a tiny bit of background, and then I'm going to show you two short videos. Um, the background is that uh, I am a climate reality presenter with the Climate Reality Project. Um, I am just as worried as Stan and hope many of you are about climate change. Um, and I'm also a member of Climate Access, um, which is about communicating about the climate and climate change. And um, one of the things I was realizing in working with both of those groups is that scare tactics don't really work. Um, they <laughs> should, and yet they don't. Um, I don't know if you've all seen John Oliver's um, bit on HBO. If you haven't, you should, when you leave here, Google John Oliver and climate change, and you'll get a good laugh. Um, but you know, as he said, you know, we've sort of collectively, we, we can't deal with the future tense, you know, don't you want to save the world for your grandchildren, and we've just collectively said, oh, I'm talking. So, um, so I thought, okay, well, what, what does work? And what tends to work is visuals and humor, right? Because when things are funny and people are laughing, they, you kind of can, you can get around whatever their blind spots are. Um, so, um, on Earth Day of last year, 2013, um, I was biking to an Earth Day event, uh, in gas guzzling traffic and all this CO2 is everywhere. And I just learned this was our week. I just learned that when you burn a gallon of gas, that 33 you know, kilowatt hour gallon of gas, it creates 19 pounds of carbon dioxide. And I got kind of shocked and grossed out by that. And I thought, well, what if you could see it? Um, so I got the idea for this film, um, kind of all in one big swoop. Um, and then I went home and I talked to my husband and I said, this is crazy, right? And he said, no, it's brilliant. It's the best idea you've ever had. You should do it. And this is the same husband who told me I should never make another film again. It's the last one I made. It took nine years. <laughs> um, so, um, so then I said, well, but yeah, I don't know if Elliot's going to want to do it. So Elliot, do you want to say what, what you thought when you first turned about this idea? Um, okay, well, I'm going to say Okay, so uh, what I thought was, I felt like, it was a good idea. I, I was not expecting this to happen. Because when she picked me up from my uh, after school at 6 o'clock, um, anyways, she's like, how would you like to do this? And I said, you know what, it's about climate change. It needs, you know what, without this film, probably half of the people on Earth may not be having these needs, which is important to me. So I decided to do it. <laughs> so he said yes. Not probably not knowing what it really meant, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So, um, so uh, since starting this film, we have um, become EV drivers ourselves, and um, mostly due to Elliot's badgering. Uh, Elliot keeps saying, "We are telling everyone that CFT is worse than food when we're driving a gas guzzling car. Like that's kind of hypocritical, right?" That's what you said, yeah. So, so we, so we promptly sold our guest as a car about a BB. Um, and let me show you now two short videos. The first one is um, we are running a Kickstarter campaign to finish funding the film. So, so far, this has all been self funded. Um, I sweet talked a colleague of mine, Sandy Franco, into filming for us. He's an Academy Award nominated cinematographer. I'm not, still not quite sure how I got so blessed, but happy to do this. We filmed at Elliott's school um, with the blessing of the green team there and the amazing support of the staff. And, um, and we made this, we filmed everything that we needed to film with Elliot in the classroom, being Professor Elliot. Um, we then used some of that footage in our Kickstarter video, which you're going to see. Um, and then in addition, in order to, and that Kickstarter campaign runs until the end of this month. And we are trying to get the word out as widely as possible. So if you all can take, I'll give you a card when you leave and tell your friends, um, spread the word widely because if every one of you tells three or four people and then they all tell three or four people, by the end of this month, if that keeps going, we'll be over our goal and then we can do it in Spanish as well, which would be extra cool. Um, uh, the second film you're going to see is 
stars Maddie Houseman, sitting over there in the corner, um, who very kindly agreed to be our very first test case of Professor Elliot Investigates uh, Carbon Free Transportation. So he um, has gone around and interviewed several different people about all different forms of carbon free transportation, um, EVs being the first one that we decided to document. Um, and we are sharing those for free widely on the web. You can share them with your friends. Um, and uh, Maddie wasn't able to, to announce in the video that she also sells these on leaves, which really sucks because she does, and she's awesome. Um, but uh, anyway, she's there in her electric auto association babies capacity talking to others. Let's turn off the light. I don't know if there's a light on this one. Do it real quick. Hi, I'm Elliot, and I'm Elliot's mom, Vanessa. And we're making a film about carbon dioxide, horse, and poop. Carbon dioxide pollution is a huge problem. It's threatening our kids' future. The problem with carbon dioxide is you can't see it. You can't smell it. You can't taste it. It's like this huge invisible problem, and that makes it really hard to fix. When someone told me that for every gallon of gas we burn, we create 19 pounds of carbon dioxide, I thought, we need to see all that pollution. What if all that crap was around? That gave me the idea to make this stop. And I am just the person that was doing it. 523R7. That is C2. There is more on that. Okay, are you ready? Mm -hmm. Did you know that burning a gallon of gas creates 19 pounds of carbon dioxide? And that's bad, because carbon dioxide is what's eating the planet. And that's really bad, because if you think about it, carbon dioxide is actually worse than poop. So that's how the film starts, but we need your help to finish it, because the best part, the part we haven't done yet. So when I point here, there's going to be animation. We have an amazing animator who will illustrate the basic facts of carbon dioxide pollution in a way that's fun and easy for kids to understand. We're working with the genius behind the Green Ninja. And we're going to take live action footage of real cars and animate the amount of carbon dioxide that comes out of them as an equivalent amount of food. And I mean, what kid doesn't love talking about it? I do. We're also going to showcase alternatives to gas burning cars to show kids how cool it is to ride their bike or take the train or take the bus or drive an electric car. But we need you to help us pay for it. And if we make it past our goal, we want to make a Spanish language version too. Because Elliot isn't just an expert in science, he's also fluent in Spanish. It's been bad and the only way we can almost build the caca. So we have our host, we have a fantastic crew. And most importantly, we have an idea for inspiring kids and changing our world, theirs, for the better. <laughs> All we need is your support. All we need is more support. So please, tell everyone you know about this project. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and donate whatever you can afford. Every little bit really makes a difference. You don't have penny, but I think we prefer something around $150. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias.
And here is episode one of Elliot Investigates Carbon Free Transportation. My inspired idea by the Tesla Model class and the hunt for alternatives to food vehicles. Elliot mm -hmm. has gotten a little obsessed with electric vehicles. So I took him to meet a Nissan Leaf aficionado, hoping she could answer some of his questions. Do you know that he was into the fast charging? It does, because the fast charging is That's cool. Okay, so you want to open the orange one on the right? Oh, and what's the difference between the orange one from the black one? So this is the direct current quick charger. And you can't have that at the house because it needs 480 volt three phase power. PG and E will not give you. Would you like to plug it in? Absolutely. Let me show you all the things they did to make this charger safe. See this? Five different connectors. It doesn't need five connectors to charge it. Some of them are just communicating with the car to say, Are you really a car? Is it really safe to charge you? Are you sure? So you can plug it in by training and you will not electrocute yourself. So, like, what do you mean? How do you charge it if you don't have one of those? Yeah, I don't have it. Well, you like plug it in somehow. I always want to do this. This looks a lot the same as the charging equipment the saw before. Yeah. It's the same yeah. connector. Uh, you want to it will not like to shoot you. I'm not a car. I like car for a car. And this is a plain plug like in your house. This car is pretty special because it's signed by the engineer and the designer. Cool. So you guys have to sell this car, you might have to raise the price. I don't know if I want to sell this car, it's a signature edition. Yeah. Should we get the signature edition? Alrighty. I was going to say thank you very much for answering the questions that I had, and we hope to see you soon, hopefully when we get the lead. Well, I can't wait to see you again. It was nice answering your questions. All right. We did not get a leaf. We didn't end up getting a leaf. They were too expensive uh, at the time. Um, but it wasn't for lack of time. <laughs> um, so yeah, you can put the lights um, somewhere over there. So. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions, but um, oh, the only other thing I was going to mention is that um, we are, uh, as of last night, 71 or 2 percent funded now in our Kickstarter campaign. We have two weeks left. Um, we have 160 backers now, I think. We would love to make it 200 by next week. Um, and, um, and you can you know, back us for as little as five bucks. It's not a big stretch. Um, and then it goes up from there. There's all kinds of awesome rewards. You can uh, you can have your face in the animation. That's the super special treat one. Um, you can just get a download of a movie. You can get, like, over some food tattoos. You can get over some poop ringtone. You can even, I think we still have some rewards where Elliot will record your outgoing voice message. Um, anyway, you can check us out on Kickstarter. Just go to kickstarter.com and type in worse than Google. Um, and um, also, just we are the the plans for disseminating the film, um, the the worse than poop film. Um, eventually, are we want to get them out into schools, and we want to get them. And we just we're actually going to hope to raise more money once the film is done, from grants to um, distribute it for free to families um, and schools. Is that money? Anyway. Um, and the idea is to have it in English and in Spanish. So our goal on Kickstarter is twenty-one thousand dollars, but we really need about thirty-five thousand in order to make it in both languages and do it right. 
Um, so all of your help will be invaluable. You can tweet about us, share it, post about it on Facebook, tell your friends, tell your plumber, tell your hairdressers. Um, and uh, and we've met, I'm working with Barbara Alford, who's the teacher on special assignment for Palo School District, where we are, um, who's our teacher on special assignment for the Next Generation Science Standards. Um, and she's a total fan and um, has assured me that it actually will work for K through 8. I was like, really, 8th graders? She goes, oh, no, so it's poop. 8th graders love poop. So um, I'm going to take her word for it. Um, so anyway, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I'm going to stick around and stick around afterwards. Um, and I want to give another shout out to Maddie for her help with this project. Yeah, okay. No questions. <laughs> Actually, have a question. Absolutely, yeah. Go ahead. Money in here. Get what? Can we just take money here? Here being where? Here, right here. Right here. Yeah. I'll, uh, is there Wi-Fi? Yes. I'll get on my Wi-Fi. You can, you can hit me up right now. Okay. Thank you. Spoke to me at uh, the Cupertino Earth Day. So uh, this is going to be an interesting thing. I wish I knew more about it, but that's why he's here. So uh, let's just let him have it. Let me get to the next version. Oh, well, thanks, everyone. Um, I'm with a company called Umconex, but we'll probably be talking more about what we're doing more than the actual pumping. So, yeah, we um, so we're, we're based on the same thing that Vanessa and Sven was. We're dedicated to stopping climate change. Um, but we're not going to do it just by fear or any other tactic. It's actually by money. We're going to give our users cash to help us prevent power tanks from turning on. Um, we're going to talk a little about demand response, which is, oh, OK, sorry. Can you get this up? Can everyone hear me now? Much better? Great. So this is a little bit more technical than the last two talks. Uh, I'd love to get your feedback and any questions as, as it goes. Um, but I'm going to give a little talk about demand response and a little bit about home connect and then we'll show you kind of what we've built and how, how it works. So our overarching vision is to stabilize the grid. So we have a very large electricity grid that uh, fluctuates in terms of voltage and frequency. And what we're doing is instead of turning on gas power plants during that time, when, when the frequency and the voltage is low, we have all of our users collectively turned down. So we replace power plants with homes. And that's the idea. So we pay our users for participating in these events, and we engage our users by paying them. Um, so has anyone heard of demand response? Can you give me some hints? OK, great. Well, that's fantastic. So I'll give you a quick history of it for the people that are not aware of the demand response. I'll give you a quick history of it and how it's being used today and how we can use it tomorrow. Um, so this is a slide that the LVNL has created for demand response. And it's fairly complex. But at the end of the day, um, at the end of this talk, I want you guys all to be able to kind of understand it at, at the basic level. So, at, at, at the very far end on the left side, you see energy efficiency, and that really is kind of part of demand response. And as we go farther to the right, which is of the future of DR, we're turning off power plants by turning off our users instantaneously. So there's a lot of details on here that are a little too, um, too much right now, but let's just jump into kind of how this all started. So I'm sure all of you guys have known about the California energy crisis in 2000, 2001. So we had rolling blackouts in June, and was basically supply was stripped on hand. Now, there was a lot of other problems with this. It was financial participants like Enron um, creating some type of uh, problems with that. But this is, this is the impetus of why demand response started. So there was rolling blackouts in June, and everyone was realizing that it hasn't even gotten to this peak of the summer. So July and August, there's going to get even worse. So Art Rosenfeld from CEC. Oh, so I'll go into the economics explanation first. So the way that the, um, 
the energy markets work, especially back in 2000, 2001, and now currently, is that you have an energy supply curve and an energy demand curve. And I'll just jump over there. But if you guys can't hear me in the back, can you hear me in the back, please? Great. So they have an energy supply curve, which is blue, and then our demand is static. As soon as you turn on the light, you need to have a supply there to actually have that light turn on. So across the entire grid, this black line is solved every five minutes, and this blue line is um, basically what their energy is, where our energy is coming from. All of these bids are kind of cold and nuclear. They're always on wind and solar. But this kind of steeper part of the curve is gas. And when we had those blackouts back in 2000, 2001, basically the, the problem was that the supply was not enough for the demand. So the curves could not intersect, and they had to turn off this demand and bring that black line further to the world. So the way that it was working is that CEC came in, Art Roosevelt said, let's do a demand relief program. And so they had this thing called optional bidding uh, mandatory, binding mandatory curtailment, which is a mouthful. And basically everyone in the valley here had people had to just have the commercial buildings turned down. And they did it by lighting, air conditioning, retrofits, all or refrigeration, and just turning down manually. And that's still how most of demand response works in the commercial and industrial sector. And it worked. It was one of the most successful programs. And the reason it worked is because we had data on it. We were able to see where people are reducing. So the green line is what they used to use. The yellow line is what we saw them reduce to. So they could tell how much they're actually reducing. So if, if you see on the left axis, there's 10 kilowatts that they were using. And it dropped down to about 8 kilowatts. In that case, that's two, or sorry, 10 megawatts to 8 megawatts. So that's two megawatts just coming down just for a single facility, which is fantastic. And so there's a ton of insights learned from it, but probably the biggest insight that came from it was just energy efficiency score. If we can reduce from 10 to 8 at any given time, or can we do it all the time? And that's been the general consensus moving forward the past 10 years, is energy efficiency has really been where a lot of our focus has been. Just everyone should reduce their usage and be more cognizant of what they're using. But we still have some demand response programs. pg e has about nine different programs. Um, only two are in the residential sector. But a lot of them, I, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with these, but these are very esoteric and not really well-known programs. So I'll get into the reasons that this now works with residential. So there's two things that have changed since, these, the, since 2000, which is the integration of smart meters. We all have smart meters. And then the price of electricity. So the reason smart meters are really important is because we actually now have data at every residential home, so we can actually see how much people are reducing. This is really important because if you reduce, I can now pay you for your reductions because you're actually helping the grid out. And you can, and not only that, the, the grid operators can say, because these people are reducing, we don't actually have to turn on the worst power plants to solve the grid. So if you're familiar with smart meters, these are all around your houses. We used to have what they call monthly readers, which aren't even smart. And people would go around looking at the meter once a month to see how much you've consumed. Then they moved on to AMR, which is automatic meter reading. And that was once a day reads. And now with AMI and with pg and &E, SDG &E, SE has deployed, that's 15 minute level data. So we have a lot of granularity. And so we'll be able to figure out what you're reducing on a daily level. The other big piece of this is that we have deregulated, deregulated electricity markets. So the price of electricity is much more transparent. So we can we can bid on it. Um, I'm going to skip over some of these slides with more uh, technical details. But one thing that I really want to point out here is this is what our energy prices look like. The black line that you see here. That spiking is usually around forty to fifty dollars per megawatt hour, but one or two hours a week it spikes up to a two thousand, a thousand to two thousand dollars. It's twenty to forty times more expensive because they have to turn on the worst gas power plant. It's a jet turbine that they basically take a jet turbine off the airplane and dump gas into it, and it's extremely inefficient and expensive. The reason they do this is because they have they need to have 
five minute power, turn on, like that. And you get those larger coal plants, those larger gas turbines, it takes them a long time to ramp up and spin faster. So these jet turbines that you've seen, you guys have all been in aircrafts, they can turn on very, very quickly. But they're super inefficient. And that's why the costs are so high. We're blind to this because the utility charges us at the red line. We only charge, the, we only pay that, that fee at all times. So when the black line is spiking, when, the, when these big spikes happen, our carbon footprint's on the order of three to four times as much. So if you turn off your lights during that time, you can save, you, you can reduce your energy stack um, to be much more, more clean and renewable. So, so this is what we see as the future. Today we're doing a lot of what they call DR, which is peak load shading, which is turning off the hottest days of the year, the three hottest days of the year, for three to four hours. It's actually fairly uncomfortable, and you might, you guys might already be doing this for PGA. But what we really need to do is move it to, towards the right, which is spinning reserves, which is real-time DR, and this is where I'm going to come from. We're a residential demand response platform that asks you to reduce your electricity, we plug into your home, and we reduce for you and pay you for it. So we connect to various different devices, which is NAS, Tesla's, Leafs, um, Prius's, Chevy Volts, all of the uh, EVs. We turn down during, during specific times, and then we get compensated by the markets. So does anyone have any questions? I know I kind of jumped through demand response really quickly, but I'd love to kind of walk you through the, the whole concept and, and, and in terms of what the product looks like. Um, so I have a question regarding how this thing will work in the future, because the few, previously what the peak demand was, now it's completely found on its head because the average of solar power is coming to it. So previously the peak demand was at 4 or 3 p.m. in a hot summer day, and now because solar will be generating volumes of power at that time, the peak demand has shifted to 8 p.m. or 7 p.m. So this demand response that was happening over at the industrial level, commercial level, no longer works because nobody is there at that time. It's so, so, so what, what's the difference? Yes, yeah, so this is an extremely good point. Because of solar coming online, we have much more heavy ramping issues. Um, the problem is, is that everyone comes home at once, and you already have a fairly steep increase of electricity, about 6 to 7 p.m. But what's, what's happening is it's compounded by the fact that all of our solar panels are going offline during that time. So you have an even steeper, steeper peak um, or a steeper ramp up. And so they're trying, like the electricity operators are trying to turn on gas power plants continually to deal with that peak. This allows us to, during any time when, when we miss our forecast on that peak, we can come in and stabilize the grid by turning off your AC, turning off your electric car from charging for about five to 10 minutes. Now, another thing that, this is kind of a side note, but, but it's very, very relevant for you, for you guys. One thing that we've been looking at is buying completely, buying car charging stations and partnering with a company that creates car charging stations and giving them out for free. The reason this is valuable is, well, obviously it's valuable for you guys because you have EVs. But the reason we can do this is that because it helps stabilize the grid. We'll turn it off for five, 10 minutes at a time so that those peaker plants don't need to turn on. And we can give out these car chargers for free in specific areas that, that have really high ramping issues, like a lot of people coming home at once. Does that make sense? So we, we've been focused purely like on, on the energy usage of our users, so where their energy is coming from and where it's going. So I'll show you a little bit about what we're doing in terms of um, converting the smart meter data to be something interesting to our users. And again, the, this isn't exactly in line with what we're doing from demand response, but this, this does give you a sense of kind of how we're thinking about where our energy is, is coming from. So, so in this uh, graph here, you can see this specific user is using uh, plug load devices, base load, cooking, refrigeration, gas heating, and AC. And what happens is a lot of our users don't know where their energy is going into for the, for the vast majority of time. 
we present this in a way that it changes over time so they can see, you know, if it's late or April, for example, it was a lot hotter in SF than usual. So the AC was much higher. So if we go all the way back to March and in, into the winter months, you see gas heating becomes your dominant usage. You can track your usage, you know, in terms of total costs, your carbon footprint, and your um, total kilowatt hours, and see how it and how it's distributed over over um, where you're spending your energy. The key here is if you click on one of these, we show you exactly where your energy is coming from over the course of the day. And we highlight the times when these demand, these really, really dirty power plants are coming on. And so if you look at this, this is somebody's consumption. It's, it's kind of erratic where you're, he's using a little bit more in the morning than the afternoon. But if he looks at his carbon footprint, that's three to four X for just that one hour. More importantly, his costs of that one hour dwarf all of those. Fifteen percent of our, use, our, our electricity costs come from less than one hour a week. So it's less than 1% of the time. So if we could cut that out, we're taking out essentially on, on the order of 15% of our carbon usage from one hour of reductions. It's a very, very specific and, and targeted reduction. So you may be asking, why, why is this cost so much more? So where is our energy coming from at that given time? And we'll show you. Um, so we built a map that shows where all the power plants are at any given time. So this gets solved every five minutes. Um, this is based on public data, um, but we're, we've done a lot of our own algorithms to actually figure this out. So this is my home as an example. I live in SF. Um, and all of these icons are different power plants. So we have a lot of gas power plants up in uh, the East Bay, north side of the East Bay. Um, we have a lot of solar closer to Sacramento that's on at all times. And then we have a couple of other, like, you'll see some geothermal up in the geysers and stuff. We have a nuke down in, um, uh, pretty far south, down near First Castle. It's about a 2.3 gigawatt nuke. And that's providing, actually, a significant portion of our power in the SF area, just because it's so large. And all of the power is flowing from the nuke to either SF or LA. Um, but the point is, is that during that really, really dirty power time, it's this peaker plan. It's actually really close by in here. It's 37 megawatts. It turns off for one or two hours a week. And that, sorry, thank you for doing it. Uh, it turns off for one or two hours a week, and that's it. It's a $25 million plant that turns off for one hour a week, 50 hours a year. And we built it because of these spikes in, in prices. Is that the one in Santa Clara? I don't, I, I don't know for sure where it is. There's one down to the south end of the bay. That's very rarely on. It's uh, it's off of Zanker Road, and the only time I've seen it running when I used to drive past it was uh, on the hottest days. Yeah, so the, the probably it, yeah. and it turns on for very short period periods of time in the hottest days of the year, like when everything is dispatched. You can tell when it's on because the heat bloom is coming off the. Uh, oh. Other okay. than that, uh, the air is stagnant across the uh, top of it. You don't see the heat bloom's. Yeah. The, um, the the reason this is so much more dirty is that this is 10% efficiency. We, we, we've developed in our engineering uh, world really, really high efficiency on our gas power plants. It's 35 to 40% efficiency in all of these plants up here, and this is 10. So we're, we're essentially burning three times more natural gas, and natural gas is fairly clean. But if you're burning three times more natural gas just to have the same amount of energy, you this is kind of wasteful, right? So as you guys all understand, well, like we can get rid of this power plant completely by turning it on one or two hours a week. So the idea is is we just will send out this email notifications and text notifications during these peak times when this inter when the electricity grid is strained. And if people all reduce, they get rewarded. And this is in terms of points. So we give people points in terms of uh, how much they reduce on each one of these event days. So we, the last event day we had was on May 13th. It was about 7 p.m. It was extremely hot outside. And it was from 7 to 7.30. We get a, we send out a notification. Everyone turns out um, at the same time. And we prevent that point from coming on. And we pay our users for doing so. So we give our, give, we're giving away cash to help us 
turn off power plants. Um, which makes sense, right? Like if you, if you don't use your electricity during these specific times, instead of turning on these really expensive power plants, we can just turn off. No, we actually are going around PG&E and going to the California ISO markets. So where PG&E gets their energy is these energy operators of um, the energy markets. So the people who are building these plants, um, Constellation, Duke, Sempra, all those bigger, bigger entities, they sell the energy on these energy markets, which is the California ISO. PG&E purchases all their power from the energy markets. And we come in as just a new generation unit. They see us as new generation because they're already planning to produce your electricity. Um, the other big piece that we're, we're working on is integration. Okay, yeah, so this is what you guys are here for. It's the integration with the electric cars. So electric cars have a huge amount of DR potential. Uh, when we're talking about most of our other uses, is, which is thermostats, that's about 0.7 kilowatts. As you guys all know, it's 6.6 .6 kilowatts to charge a, a LEAF uh, and Tesla, and 3.3 for voltage, something like that. So you're talking about 10 thermostats going down all at once. So, and you don't really need, usually, usually when you're charging your electric car, you don't need it to be charged in a very specific amount of time. If you're charging it overnight, you're plugging it in at maybe midnight, and then by 7 a.m. it needs to be charged. So we control how the, how the charge is coming in during that seven hours, and we give you cash for doing so, and we help keep the grid, the, the, the dirty power plants up. Cool, so is there any other questions that you guys might have? We'd love to chat more about this. It's called Home Connect. <coughs> Well, the credit is presumably based on historical use. In other words, if you weren't using any, you weren't getting any credit. Yes. Yes, exactly. So, so the way that um, the way that this works is that you, you, every single person has their own baseline. So the baseline is based on the past ten days of your electricity usage, and it matches exactly. So if you deviate from what you did the past ten days, you can get credit for it. If you don't deviate from that, you can't get any credit. If you actually use more, yeah, exactly, exactly. So ideally, if ever, I mean, if you, but but the other the other question I often get is, if you have solar panels, does this help you? And and it does, because you can always reduce further on than what you're using, even when the solar panels are on. Even if you're getting negative five kilowatts coming out of your solar panels into the grid, if you can move that from negative five to negative six. We can still sell that extra one kilowatt back in the grid and keep that power back. Great. Um, so, any other questions? Okay. Are the devices that we walk for the electrolytes automatically, or is that something we want? Yeah, we're actually doing discounts on all of the all of the Nest signups. So, anyone who signs up with the Nest and allows us to control it, we're giving twenty five dollars right away. Um, and then same with any of these other devices except Belkin. We're only giving $10 for these. And it depends on what you're plugged into for the Belkin. Good. Is there any future plan to restrict the load by the local energy storage? In other words, how about we be contain batteries? Is there any plan that you'd like to have to fix the speed of the load? Yeah, that, that, that's something that I'm not. Um, it, it is certainly on the long term roadmap. Um, it's not something I, I'm yet fully comfortable with. Uh, I don't have enough energy experience, or like battery experience, to know how much discharging their battery will affect the lifetime of the car. Now, obviously, we're not going to give users ten dollars a month or a year if their car is going to last a year or die a year sooner. So there needs to be some more analysis there. Um, my background's in mechanical and chemical engineering, so I don't yet know battery. That's more electrical. Um, so but yeah, yeah, it's definitely like, the way I see the way that OneConnect sees battery storage is that there's no reason to build new big battery banks. We basically have our own battery banks in each one of our homes. We just need to take advantage of it and utilize it. There's, like when you turn off your AC for 15 minutes, you're not going to really see a difference. You have too much thermal mass within your home to actually see a difference. 
So why are we building hundreds of thousands of dollars in battery banks to allow us to shift the load a little bit more when we can just do it right now by plugging it into our already connected homes? So. Um, during this short uh, late evening time when you uh, set, set power, do you actually do rolling blackouts of the air conditioners or do you? Okay. Exactly. That's exactly. We, so we cycle in air conditioning so that no one gets, no one even notices it, but they're just getting paid at the end of the month for helping to save the environment. This is such a overdue. Yeah. Cool. Any other? Yeah. Um, to build on to the excellent point about all our EVs and batteries, I, I, and this is not a, an urgent problem, but something in your industry that people can think about is over time. Uh, I mean, these EVs, knock on wood, will last a long, long time and get new battery every five or ten years or whatever. And those batteries, if they're no longer good for an EV, can still play a huge role in what, what you're doing. Exactly, right. And this is, that's the beauty of it, is that this is already used, or that's already been created. And disposing it is actually a really high challenge, right? So this is a perfect way to dispose of it, right? Yeah. So. All right, and I'll be around if anyone wants to try it out there. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Oh, okay, Vanessa. One really important thing. Okay. I just wanted to say one really important thing that I forgot to mention, which is that our project is non-profit. So if you are interested in contributing or you know other people who are interested in contributing, it's a tax write-up. I don't know about you guys, but that seems to be like the first time they've ever finished really. <laughs> um, I do have an announcement, however. Sven, with the grace of his wife, has invited everyone to after the meeting at 12.30, which is in that 15 minutes, until we're supposed to be over. Uh, at his house at uh, 314 Stanford Avenue. Um, he's, he's very grateful that his wife is allowing him to do this. So, big <laughs> party at Sven's house after the meeting. I don't know if you're food in wine or not, but we'll see. Question civil. Sven is hoping that if you do come to this house at 314 Stanford Avenue after the meeting, that you will introduce yourself to his wife. Her name is Kate. And thank Kate for allowing Sven to do all the wonderful things. some points. <laughs> Not just these points. So thank you all for coming. And remember, I'm looking for volunteers. So if you guys are willing, uh, I'm able. Thank you. Right.